Satan is the god of this world, according to Scripture. And, um, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So, I mean, I have to take that as truth. And, and it, it is evident. I mean, you can go in any culture in the world and you'll see evidence of this in terms of people, you know, addicted to problems in their life or, you know, having horrible nightmares or mental struggles. The major reason people drink and take drugs is they have no mental peace. And that's where the battle is. It's primarily a spiritual battle. Some of the overt stuff that you see a lot of that is more like a caricature. The real battle is more internal, and, and people will struggle with that and oftentimes don't know what to do about it or where to get help for it. Why do you think our society is so fascinated with the, those, that kind of media, though? Well, it, it, it sells movies, I guess. You know, it's part of this scary thing. I mean, it's, you know, it is scary for a lot of people, things that go bump in the night. In fact, uh, uh, what I've discovered as a Christian over the years is that more people, even in our churches, are afraid of the devil than they are of God, which is actually a, a reverse of what should be true and what actually is true. The, the real problem that people uh, don't understand about the spiritual world in which we live is that <clears throat> uh, it's, I've got to get my own thoughts on that, what I was going to say. It's hard, let me put it this way, it's hard for a Westerner who's steeped in Western rationalism and naturalism uh, to understand that there actually is a spiritual world around us. When the Apostle Paul says that what you see is temporal and is passing away, that what you don't see is eternal. I mean, from his perspective, actually what you don't see is more real and lasting than what you do see. And, and it's hard. And I was an aerospace engineer, and, and I was so left-brained at one time, my head tilted on one side. I mean, that was my orientation. I personally had to go through a lot of paradigm shifts to come up with an adequate answer for people's problems. I had to include somehow the reality of the spiritual world. It's tough for us because we don't see it sometimes, but we can see the evidence of it everywhere. I mean, just look at the evil around us. I remember I was on a radio program after the terrible shooting where 21, 20 kids were killed, and uh, one guy got up and said, this has nothing to do with evil, this is mental illness. I thought, if that's not evil, what in the world is evil? I mean, it's that kind of Western orientation. Now, if you go to two-thirds of the rest of the world, they don't have that orientation. They clearly uh, believe there's a spiritual world. I mean, spiritism is actually the most practiced religious orientation in the world, by far. Any missiologist will tell you that. If you go to Brazil, 85% of the Brazilian population are practicing spiritists. And by that, I mean they will seek out a witch doctor, a quack doctor, or a shaman, somehow or another to get guidance in their life or to ward off you know, evil influences in their life. So, I mean, it's only here in America, parts of Canada, a little bit of Western Europe, that we have this kind of natural orientation to the world we live in. But that is not the rest of the world. Well, that's very typical. That's, that's what we do in the West, is we just simply say, you know, we're more profound. I said, do you realize that we distribute more child pornography around the world than any other culture of the world? I mean, evil is just as present here. What's different about the spiritual battle here, as opposed to, say, Africa or Indonesia or a place like that, there it's much more known, so it's much more out in the open. Here it's all deception, uh, and yet the battles are there. Let me point out where the primary battle is. It's in our minds. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul says. In latter days, days of which we're living right now, people will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceiving spirits and teachings of demons. Is that happening here in America? It's happening all over the place. Uh, am I the only one seeing it? Absolutely not. Every, every psychiatrist is dealing with people who are hearing voices. Every psychologist is probably dealing with people who are struggling with foul thoughts, you know, blasphemous thoughts sometimes. If you've got some kind of a prison ministry and they're incarcerated for a crime they committed, how many are hearing voices? All of them are. The only difference is they will tell you and they will probably use it as some kind of an excuse. So <clears throat> it is far more present and present in our experience than we realize. We just haven't known the nature of the battle. Uh, we always think of, uh, of the occult or the, or the spiritual world as being some kind of bizarre experience or somebody foaming at the mouth or watching The Exorcist, which was a terrible tragedy of a movie. Living the population think that somehow this poor priest has no match for Satan. 
when just the opposite is true. And, and yet we believe that. And because of that, people are, are literally afraid of things that go bump in the night. Yes, several years ago, when I started to, uh, to help adults, you know, get free from these kind of influences in their life and really find their freedom in Christ, <clears throat> I realized that almost all of their problems originated when they were young. So we did some research. We researched 1,725 professing Christian young people. Now, we went to very conservative churches and schools to do this. Uh, I mean, the results, even at that time, were alarming to myself. 71% said they were hearing voices, like there was a subconscious self talking to them. Uh, now, do I think they're mentally ill? No, I don't. I believe there is a spiritual battle going on for their mind because I've seen God set them free from that just time and time and time again and walk out with a peace of God that passes all understanding. But how many of that group played Dungeons and Dragons, for instance? It's kind of a, you know, kind of an occulty kind of a game that they would play. It's kind of passe now, but in those days, of that group, about 280 or so had, of that group, 43% have impulsive thoughts to kill people or grab a knife and stab somebody. Now, they don't do that, but can you imagine what they think of themselves? Now, how can I have that kind of a thought? Uh, if, you, if you understand what you're looking for, it becomes much more obvious. For instance, I've had people come to a conference and I'm saying, here's a mom who comes home from the hospital, just had her second or third child, her electrolytes are depleted, she's tired, kids are creaming, and all of a sudden she has a thought, kill your baby. Now, who's she going to share that with? Her husband? Honey, I've had thought about killing the kids. No, she's, she's stuck. She can't share that with anybody. Now, does that happen? Every time I've shared that in a conference, some ladies come up to me and tell me, that's exactly what was happening to me. You know, what's wrong with me? I said, there's nothing wrong with you. That's, it's not you that's thinking that thought. And uh, I said, but occasionally they do. Remember the story about the lady in Texas who drowned five of her kids? She told them it was a spiritual battle for her mind, and it was. But it just got put off as postpartum depression. I said, so we've, we've done that. If somebody comes in, they're, they're having a lot of fear, and they're hearing voices. It's an automatic diagnosis. Paranoid schizophrenic. But is that the real cause for it? And is there an answer then? Do they have an answer for that? I said, sure, we gave them antipsychotic medication, the voices stopped. Sure, so did everything else. All you did was narcotize it. Which, by the way, is the reason people drink and take drugs. They have no mental peace, so they drown it out, only to wake up the next morning a little bit worse. What if there was a way to sit down with that person and get rid of those thoughts? And if you got rid of them, are they part of you? No. And uh, so you need to ask an honest question, though. How can a chemical imbalance produce a personality and a thought? Or how can my neurotransmitters randomly fire and create a thought that I'm opposed to thinking? And you have a natural explanation for that? Boy, I'm open. What is it? There isn't one. And so you just medicate it, essentially, but you haven't solved anything. But what if you actually sat down with a hurt person, helped them submit to God, resist the devil, and walk out free, and those voices are gone? Then it couldn't be them. It's not a flesh pattern. Now, we have struggles with that as well. But if it leaves, it's not a flesh pattern, because flesh patterns don't leave. And so if something leaves, and all of a sudden you're free, and your mind is free, what just happened? So what's really going on when teenagers experience you know, the occult in these seemingly innocent ways, whether it's Ouija boards, tarot cards, palm reading, I guess is very popular now. What, what's actually going on? What's causing it? It's false guidance. That's the first thing in our steps to freedom that they look at. Is that an entry point? For the enemy, yes, it is. I've seen people go back to just playing with Ouija board or the, even the magic eight ball. It's false guidance. Now, I, <laughs> this is a great story. I love to tell it. When I was getting my doctorate at Pepperdine, essentially it was a secular program. We had a class on futures. And this principal of an inner city school came in, and his whole presentation was on what now we would call New Age. We didn't really have that label at that time. And, and he brought out all this stuff of astral projection and, you know, metal transportation and all that kind of junk. And, and I'm just sitting there, my eyes are getting bigger. <laughs> and I watched the people in the classroom. They were curious, asking questions. You know, that leer of knowledge and power can suck almost anybody in. 
And uh, so I just kept my mouth shut. And finally, at the end, I said, when you were researching this, did you ever ask the question whether this is right or wrong? No, I said, I'm not interested in that. I said, I would be if I was you. You have described nothing new. That's as old as biblical history, and God prohibited it. In fact, if you were a medium or a spiritist, you were to be cut off. You were to be killed, actually. If you consulted them, you were to be cut off from the rest of the people. That's how serious false guidance is. And um, God obviously takes that very, very seriously. And, and it, it, it is an entry into something in your life that will potentially control you. I don't know my astrological sign to this day, and so I've never been curious about that kind of stuff. But people say, well, I just read it. It doesn't mean anything. I said, you just put it into your mind. And that little thought came in this morning, beware of strangers today. And you meet a stranger. What's the last thing you put in your mind? Beware of them. <laughs> so what's guiding you right now? It, it, it's very, very subtle stuff. Um, do you think society's talked about being called a change over the years? You well, it, yes. Uh, what, what is really interesting is that the, the Tower of Babel was essentially a man's attempted to be a god for himself. And when God dispersed their languages, they went around the world. They took those occultive practices with them and embedded them in their culture. And we keep renewing them every year. If you go to Norway and you go to a gift shop, what do you find there? Little trolls. And you go to England and there's a gift shop, what do you find? Gremlins. Uh, we celebrate Halloween, which is not a Christian uh, thing at all. And, and, and we just see that in every culture around the world. It's kind of embedded in their cultural thing. It's just part of our culture. So we just kind of make fun of it. I said, but we're not playing the game. There's eternal consequences with uh, what we celebrate, what we believe, how we live, et cetera. And, uh, and that makes some of those cultures very, very resistant to the gospel, to hear the good news. Here's a very important point, however. If you read any of the early church literature, the number one appeal evangelistically was to free people from demonic influences. That's why they came to church, because they knew that. And, and even when, when Jesus was with us at that time, when he would disclose what was going on in their hearts, because he knew their hearts and their minds, what was their response? He has a demon. Now, even the culture at that time, and you had that kind of esoteric knowledge, knowledge that didn't come by way of normal study or research forever, Somehow you had this insight coming to you. They assumed it was from a demon. And so what we do today is we don't call them a medium. We call them a channeler. We don't call it a demon. We call it a spirit guide. And suddenly it's acceptable to a very, very gullible public. It's the same thing. You describe some inanimate objects like trolls and gremlins and things like that. And, and you say that the kids dress up in Halloween. Like, are you ascribing some sort of power to those? Now, uh, no, I'm not, uh, to be honest with you. It's just symbols. It, it's what you believe about them that, that's what counts. It, it, you know, it's just a little wooden doll or plastic or whatever else it is. That's not the problem. It's the belief behind it. Uh, un understand something. You know, God created Lucifer. He didn't create Satan. Lucifer essentially created Satan when he chose to rebel against God. And that introduced evil into this world. God's, if you look at the Bible, what is it? It's primarily a battle between good and evil, between the Christ and the Antichrist, the false prophets, the true prophets, the father of lies, the spirit of truth. And everybody on this planet is, is in this battle whether they know it or not. <laughs> the question is how do we understand it and how do we win this battle? And you can't win it by just rationally arguing, for instance, or something like that. That doesn't really work. This truly is a spiritual battle. And when you read the Gospels, one of the great things that Jesus clearly demonstrated to us was his superiority, his authority over that kingdom of darkness. And when he commissioned the church to go into all the world, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and upon this earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Now, we need to know that because if you're going to go out into this fallen world where the god of this world is Satan, and Jesus referred to him as the ruler of this world, you better have the authority to do that. And every child of God does. So what problem would you say there being in kids watching occult-related media or reading these Twilight books, vampires, zombies? 
Well, the research that we did 20 years ago is far worse now with the advent of the internet and, and all the video programs. I mean, 20% of your teenagers are sexting. <laughs> I mean, think about that. And uh, that's amazing to me. I mean, that would have been unbelievably embarrassing when I was a child, but to take a picture of your private parts and share them around is like, you did what? <laughs> I mean, that's how much our culture has changed today. Uh, what I find in my ministry is, is that young kids are far more uh, inclined to accept what I'm sharing than the older generation is. Uh, it was a much more innocent generation that I was raised in. I mean, this stuff wasn't even available to me in the, in the 50s when I grew up. So the, the whole culture has shifted. But look at the rampant sex, for instance. Is there a spiritual connection there? Oh, absolutely there is. Uh, Did you connect these, this, these occult films like Paranormal Activity? That's a huge movie. It just makes piles and piles of money. Um, the right, the possessions of females. So there's these, all these films that you know talk about this. Is, I just guess I'm asking you: Is there a problem with people taking that in, or or is that not an issue taking in if you believe something else? You know, let, let me start with a very innocent thing. Years ago, uh, there was a series called Bewitched, where this kind of nice-looking witch, you know, kind of a thing would do her little uh, dillywickers. You say, well, that's, that's, that's innocent. I, one of my favorite testimonies is the gal who saw that, who had a terrible problem with her mother, and she said, by watching that, I knew somehow there was a power out there, and I wanted it. And, uh, and that led her on a journey where she ended up with spirit guides, demons, that she needed to get help to overcome that. And you say a simple little innocent thing like that? Or how about Harry Potter? Do you realize since that movie come out, that, that whole series, that the number of adults in England seeking paranormal activity and consulting spiritists more than doubled? Adults, not just children. When uh, Campus Crusade for Christ had me go on campuses around Southern California to respond to a little flyer, come here about demonic influences, I, I was blown away, to be honest with you. They didn't were coming here, Neil Anderson. They didn't know who I was. Long Beach State University, we had 400 people show up Monday at noon. Now, what if you said, come here about the claims of Christ? You know, who would have been there? You know, two staff and 10 trapped friends. You know, but that's where our college is at. Here in Canada, uh, Alberta, uh, when I was doing a conference in Edmonton, <clears throat> I went down to the university. And we had a huge crowd show up just to hear about demonic influences. Well, you know, because I share a lot of stories of, of actual encounters that I've had working with people around the world. What it does, because I would always shift it from, yes, it's out there, but is this good? And uh, then, they would, then I would be just be crowded by people. That's happening to me. This is my struggle. In our culture, because of the way we're wired here in the West, nobody's going to come up and share with you, by the way, I'm hearing voices. Or I'm having these condemning thoughts or blasphemous thoughts. Because the knee-jerk response in our Western culture is, boy, you're mentally ill, let me give you this medicine. Well, they don't want that affirmed, so they don't know what to do about it. And the very thought, you mean I could get rid of this? I Just recently, I led a gal through the steps to freedom. And afterwards, she just looked up at me and she said, did you turn on another light? And my mind is quiet. I can't believe that. My mind is quiet. I always thought that was just normal to have all these distracting thoughts. She was paying attention to a deceiving spirit. But she had no idea what it was. And uh, she just thought that was normal. And why don't we know this? Well, truthfully, I can't read your mind. You can't read mine. So unless you have the courage to tell me what's going on in your mind, I don't know. And so all we see is the behavior, so we try to change that. And that doesn't work. You're not transformed by the renewing of your behavior, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, um, and that's why the Apostle Paul instructed us, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. If it's not true, don't believe it. And uh, so that, that spiritual battle is going on all over the world, all over the world right now. And it has. It has ever since the fall. It's nothing new. Well, think about this. They're spirits. So they have no power to, to move you. Uh, I use this as an illustration. When I was born and raised on a farm, we had some, uh, a neighbor that we would 
share work with, et cetera. We go over there. They have this yappy little dog. It scared the socks off of me. And my brother would be with me and my dad, and that dog would come barking around the corner, and, man, I ran. Guess who we chased? My dad would sit right there. My brother would, wouldn't, even, wouldn't even acknowledge their presence, and I would run up on top of the pickup cab. Now, what power did that dog have to put me up on top of that pickup cab? None. He used my mind, my emotions, my will, and my muscles. That's how I got up there. <laughs> and Dad would say one day, son, this is kind of embarrassing. It's just a little dog. Why don't you stand your ground? And so great big beads of sweat welled up, you know, and I was all prepared. That dog came around the corner, and I kicked a stone at it, and he ran. He actually doesn't have any power. It's only what you give to him. And it's really all deception. It's all a lie, essentially. And he's the father of lies. But if you believe a lie, he can just tear you up. And, uh, you know, if you look at uh, irrational fears, the clue is it's irrational. So if you want to get rid of the fear, do you get rid of the emotional fear? No, you get rid of the lie behind it. Uh, why are people anxious? Because they're double-minded. And uh, that's literally what the word means, by the way. It comes from two words, divide and, not, and, and mind. And so if you're paying attention to deceiving the spirit and believing the truth over here, man, you're going back and forth, back and forth. And uh, so it all comes down to a battle for the mind. But a spirit has to have some animate, you know, source to operate in. And so that's even when the gathering demoniac, you know, why do you have to do with us, Jesus? You know, because I'm the God. So he's run with the pigs, and the pigs all ran over the cliff. You know, suicide is the end result of all of that. That was the pig stop on the way to the pit stop, by the way. And uh, it's, uh, so he has to operate somehow through people. Even as Christians, to be honest with you, you know, God lives his life through us. And people who are demonically influenced and, and listen to the father of lies, they do that bidding as well. Now, they don't always do it, but they're troubled by it. People would ask, then, can demons read minds? And how do they interact with your mind, then? Well, it's a very fine line we have to draw because it's very, very important. Only God knows the thoughts and intentions of my heart. And God perfectly knows me and, uh, and loves me. That's the amazing part. It's, um, <clears throat> uh, it's not hard to tell you what you're thinking if I gave you the thought. So he can do that. And, and we got clear evidence of that in Scripture. Uh, in Chronicles, for instance, it, it says that the devil, having put into the heart of David to number the troops, well, that, that is really revealing because David had a whole heart for God. Uh, now, what is even wrong with that? Wouldn't you want to know how many troops you have? Now, the captain of his guard knew it was wrong and said, don't bring this sin upon us, but he did anyhow. But you'd still be left with the question, how did he do that? Well, these were David's thoughts, or at least he thought they were. See, there's the deception. And that's what we don't always see today. We don't know that it's where it's coming from. If we knew where it's coming from, we'd probably stop, you know, immediately. But we don't know. That's why we're, deception is such an, eel, an issue. Listen, be, before Jesus went home to the Father and after the resurrection, he has what we call the high priestly prayer in John 17. Now, he's going to leave behind the 11. He's already lost one, by the way. Satan had put in the heart of Judas to betray Christ, one of the 12. So he's down to his 11, and uh, he's talking with them. I ask not that you take them out of this world, but you keep them from the evil one. How? Sanctify them in thy word, thy word is truth. Now think about this. This is the first concern of our Lord. First concern. Well, I'm concerned too. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I am concerned as Satan deceived thee by his craftiness that our minds would be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. I'm concerned too. Uh, these, are, these are very important portions of Scripture telling us the kind of world we're living in today. Uh, and uh, so if that's his first concern on, on the church left down on this planet, it should be our first concern is to help people to be sanctified in that word, that word is truth. Truth sets us free. But truth is more than a book. It's a person. Jesus is the truth. God, my Father, will set me free. Is there a hierarchy or ranking among the, the demons? I think there are. Uh, how, does, how does a created being who is not omnipresent keep a worldwide rule? 
Well, any honest theologian would tell you it's through principalities, powers, dominions, and rulers. Uh, I, uh, I had the privilege to lead a guy to Christ who came out of Satanism. Now, this wasn't a dabbler. This guy was raised in it. His mother was a Satanist. He was raised to be a Satanist. This is hardcore stuff. I mean, the moment he came to him, I said, you can't just leave Satanism. You're still in the kingdom of darkness. You'd have to choose Christ to get out of it. And all hell broke loose when that happened, when I said that. And, um, but eventually he went for it and, and made a decision to do that. And uh, Now, here's somebody that was raised in it, steeped in it. Satanism, by the way, is not Anton LaVey. And if you know about it, that's a caricature. True Satanism is underground. You don't know about it. If you know about it, it gets exposed. It just stops right there. And so it, that's what I'm most concerned about. I learned that through the hard work. Well, I've seen them actually take people out, commit suicide. Uh, he'll never get to trial, for instance. Uh, fortunately, I think that's good because it would just be a battle over the Bible or something, and, and the Christian would probably lose that one. But, uh, but he's the one who pointed that out to me. He said, even hardcore underground Satanism, he said, if you know about it, it's the surface level, but there's three different layers under that, and they correspond to three demonic levels as well. So you have some strongholds that are much more resistant than others, and I've seen that. I, I've seen cases where, boy, this is going to be a fight, and others is just very simple. How did this guy get out? Well, uh, he really struggled. They really went after him. The mental harassment was horrible. He was shot at. He was actually tied up and branded in his own house. And I found out later... Uh, they came and said, we'll stop the harassment if you stop sharing. And uh, unfortunately, he did. But you don't make a deal with the devil, and I've never seen him since. I don't know what happened to him. How, how common has it been in your experience of, of actually getting to these levels? Well, uh, in my book, uh, Rough Road to Freedom, is my memoirs. I just put it out. I talk in there about a chapter of how God was just bringing this stuff to me and showing me the depth of it and how much is there. I mean, and I really personally came to a conclusion for myself personally. I think it's true for the church. I said, okay, it's there. It's not my battle. Mine is to help Christians, help people who want to be free in Christ and help them get there. But the devil, in one sense, is already defeated. He was disarmed at the cross, and it's my job to proclaim that. So I don't go out and look for that kind of stuff. If it comes my way, I deal with it. Uh, but I don't, think it's, I don't think it's the role of the church to do that. You come to for us for help, we'll help you. Uh, but uh, I, I, let me put it this way. I don't have to know the enemy because the enemy is a chameleon. He'll change. That's why you don't see much instruction for Scripture about you know, Satan's tactics for the simple reason he's a liar. He'll just change tomorrow, whereas the opposite is true for God. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He'll never change. And it's because of that eternal consistency that I have stability in my life. If God all of a sudden said, well, I may, I've changed my mind, where would we be today as Christians? We'd be lost, to be honest with you. Are you going to change your mind again tomorrow then? So the key to this is, is not learning all of Satan's tactics, because I've discovered over the years it's all over the map. There is no consistency there. The consistency is in Christ. And so what I have to know then is not the lie, but the truth. And, and Scripture constantly reaffirms that. Finally, brother, whatever is true and right and lovely, think on those things. Never does he tell me, don't think negative thoughts, because that doesn't work. You just keep choosing the truth. That works. And so it's, it's like people who deal with counterfeit, they don't study counterfeit $10 bills or whatever. They, they study the true thing. And when the counterfeit shows up, they know it. They can sense it and recognize it immediately. And that's what we have to do as, as Christians as well. That's not true, what you just said right now. What is it? How do you know that? Because this is the truth. And um, now, you just go on from there, but the point of it is, is that, you know, that's what, he, that's what Jesus prayed for, that we'd be sanctified in that word, that word is truth. And, and boy, if there was ever a day the world needs truth, it is today. You know, I mean, just think about it. How many politicians lie? How many people lie? How many kids lie? If you go over to Asia, how many people in Asia will lie to save face? All of them will. And if you don't know that when you go over there, <laughs> you can go for a ride. What would you say to a teenager who's just so interested in becoming 
in kind of in academia, things of that sort, because they just see it as this interesting, powerful world that you know they could be privy to. Well, you you said the right word. It is a power trip, and people want that. I mean, think about it. If you truly had that kind of knowledge, uh, the pretense of Satan is that I got precognition that I can know before time. If you actually could do that, do you realize how much power? You'd just go to the racetracks. You'd win every race if you knew who was going to win tomorrow. It, you know, but it's really a lie. He doesn't perfectly know the future. That's why uh, a true prophet was separated from a false prophet because a false prophet, not everything he said came true. A true prophet is a true prophet. What he says will come to pass. Now, if you can say something before time, you have to have power to bring that about. You have to have some means by which you can orchestrate that. Otherwise, you couldn't. So power is the big issue. It's a power trip for people. Why would the demon want to possess a body? Why are they continually infatuated with physicality? Well, your car wouldn't run without gas. <laughs> they have to have a vehicle by which to to bring it about. You know, essentially, if if you just if you're totally deceptive and you live in the world of the occult, you're just a tool of the enemy. But he needs your arms and mouth and lips to bring that about. He can't. He doesn't have any arms or lips or feet. And uh, so, essentially, he needs animate objects. That's why you will find, for instance, prayer groups going on, and all of a sudden, dogs will start howling. Well, a demon can't haul, it doesn't have a mouth, doesn't have a vocal cord. By the way, this is the other interesting issue. It's very, very important to realize this. I said, when people are hearing voices, how are they hearing? Well, to hear in the natural world, you have to have a sound source. And that's just a physical phenomenon. That's a compression and rarefraction of air molecules. Hits my eardrums, sends a signal to my brain. How do you see? You have to have a light source reflecting off of a material object. And that goes back to your optic nerves as a signal to your brain. Now, if you turn off this light, you wouldn't see me. You have to have a physical light source. So when people say they see something in my office, because I've had people say, look at there, and they say they see something, what are they seeing? Because I look there, I don't see it. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. It isn't out there, it's here. And they're just using my little brain cells to bring that about. So a mom goes into her child's room, and baby's crying or something, Mommy, there's something in my room. And as a Western parent, we would say, Honey, I looked under the bed in the closet. There's nobody here. Go back to sleep. You're an adult. You saw something in your room. Would you go back to sleep? But see, it wasn't in the room. It was here. And that's why we missed that. And I've seen this all the time in my office. People hearing voices, seeing things. And uh, we sit down, work only with the person. They walk out, can't see it anymore. Don't hear it anymore either. Lights are turned out, there's rumblings, there's all sorts of things. Paint cans fall over, it seems. The guy's flashlight doesn't work anymore. What's your response to something like that? <laughs> so, that's like taking a camera to try to take a film of a radio wave. <laughs> there's spiritual world out there, but it's spiritual. And uh, sure, they have some way to, to move animate objects in, in that, but... Uh, even people have told me, I saw something go across the room. I said, did something actually probably go across the room? Probably not. It's just what they saw in here. So you, are you so skeptical would you say that they actually can't move an inanimate, inanimate object? That's a twilight area for me, to be honest with you. I've not seen it. Uh, I, 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 my, my general natural answer is no, they would need somebody to move it. I mean, it's just like the way that little puppy got me up on top of that pickup cab. He used my mind, my will, my emotions, and my muscles. I've seen that happen. And I've seen what appears to be almost supernatural strength. That's why I never touch somebody who's in that condition. I never try to physically manhandle them. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. We don't even deal with it that way. And I said, well, how do I explain that? Because it just seems like he has supernatural power. I said, actually, that happens sometimes for good. You'll have... You can actually have such an adrenaline rush within you that somebody's in an accident and some little old lady will tip over a car or something like that. And they go back and try it again physically, they can't do it. But they just run that adrenaline thing into the stops and, and you can peer what appears to be supernatural. But it actually is quite natural 
it's, it's just such a extreme adrenaline rush that you can do things you couldn't normally naturally do. And so I've, I've seen that as well. But when you get a person to a right mind, could they do it again? No. I say, well, what gave them that power? I said, actually, it's just such an adrenaline rush within your own system that you do things that you actually couldn't naturally normally do. And, and you can, that actually happens for good at times. Are you talking about your power encounters? Some well, I remember... One time this counselor called me and said, I've never given any place for the demonic, but maybe this girl has this problem. I walked over there. Four years of counseling, EKGs, CAT scans, and you name it. I said, there's a pentagram cut into her skin. There's a clue. <laughs> now, if you could see it here, you know, you'll never see it, of course. But, and I looked at her. I said, honey, there's a battle going on for your mind. Oh, thank God somebody understands. And so she came to see me the next week. Now, here was a case. Extremely difficult, by the way. <clears throat> She was a satanic ritual abuse victim. She had been subjected to satanic rituals. Here's an incredible thing. They were still going on. At that time, she was switching personalities at night because almost every one of those people end up what they call DID, dissociative identity disorder. We used to call it multiple personality. She would switch at night and go to satanic rituals, come home in the daytime and have cuts on her, had no idea how they got there. Uh, she had cuts all over her arms, so many so that she wore a sweatshirt to cover her scars on her arms and other symbols that she had. And uh, so, and because of the abuse, she was quite large as a person. And suddenly she gets out of her chair and starts walking towards me. <laughs> I use that sometimes as I train people to help others. And I said, what would you do? I just looked at her and I said, I'm a child of God. You can't touch me. That's 1 John 5.18. And she stopped in her tracks. I said, sit down. She did. Now, the authority that we have in Christ does not increase with volume. We don't shout out the devil. We just calmly take our place in Christ. In that sense, it's no different than parental authority. If you're screaming, yelling at your kids to somehow control their behavior, you actually aren't exercising your God-given authority. You're undermining it. It'll bring about a brief result, you know, so they'll stop. But the lasting effect of it probably won't be good. And so it, it's a very interesting thing. We do have the authority to continue on Christ's work. But it's his authority. It's his power. It's not mine. So I need to abide in Christ. I need to be you know, under his uh, protective authority myself. But I do believe that. I said, I'm a child of God. You can't touch me. I've had people uh, come up to me. You know, one police officer was sweating profusely. He said, Neil, I have these thoughts to grab my knife and, and stab you. I said, well, thanks for sharing that. But th what's interesting, as soon as he brought that on the light, power's broken because it's all a lie. And the sweating stopped, and he stopped shaking. I said, you know that's not you, right? Now I do. But, you know, he was wondering, what in the heck is wrong with me? I had a gal come to a conference, sat in the front row glaring at me. And her friend afterwards came over and said, can you help my friend? She can't get off the front pew. <laughs> I walked over and said, just sit there for a few minutes. You'll be fine, and uh, you can get up a little later and walk on. And they all do. But uh, I found out that she was a uh, psychiatric nurse, and uh, she had driven by a gun shop for three days in a row, fighting off a temptation to bring a gun to the conference to shoot me. One gal, the first night the conference started, she was sitting in the back row, and everybody had left, and I was picking up my nose, started to walk out. And she walks down, just a very large lady. She said, I feared you. I've hated you. I said, good grief, lady, who are you? <laughs> she actually had razor blades in her, in her Bible that stuck between the pages. And um, so am I afraid of that? No, no, of course not. Uh, you know, that, that's not the valid object for our fear. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And, uh, and, and once that's in place in your own mind, I said, you know that God is omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, and wherever I go, behold, God is there. L let me draw a parallel to help people understand this better. Because I've had people say, you, you mean to tell me there are demons in this world? I said, let me tell you what else is here, germs. Now, everybody's believed that, and almost nobody has seen them. You know, biologists do, of course. I said... But what's the proper response to that? You start looking for germs? You'd be a hypochondriac. <laughs> I, said, I said, what's the proper response? Live a balanced life. 
Get enough rest, exercise, eat properly. Your immune system will take care of you. There's demons in this world. So live a righteous life. It's really that simple. Well, if that's the answer, then why do we even need to know about them? For the same reason we need to know there were demons. Is the same reason we need to know there are germs. 200 years ago, we didn't know there were germs. Doctors didn't scrub up, didn't sterilize their equipment. The average person lived to be about 45. People died, needlessly, didn't have to. Same issue here. Why do we need to worry about demons? So it's my focus? No, my focus is on Christ. So I know enough to put on the armor of God, to take every thought captive to the obedience to Christ, to stand firm, to resist. If I didn't know that, didn't know what the nature of the battle is, I wouldn't even know how to fight it. I wouldn't even know this fight. But we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Paul's very clear about that. But principalities, powers, dominions, and rulers. And uh, the good news is for the Christian, the battle's already won. We just have to claim our place in Christ and, and live accordingly. For the fallen world, it's Satan has blinded the mind of the unbelieving. And uh, that's what we're struggling with. And Scripture tells us that. He's blinded the mind of the unbelieving. And uh, that's why it's just not a rational discussion. This is a, is a spiritual battle, and it has to be fought on that plane. Can you talk to us, talk us through spiritual warfare, like Ephesians 2, 6-10? Well, Ephesians chapter 6 is, is, is uh, where he says, We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, for that's the nature of our battle. When you put on the armor of God, what you're really doing is putting on Christ. Unfortunately, we go into church and we call that a sanctuary. I said, it is not, actually. It's a nice auditorium, but you may do more spiritual battle there than many other places. Uh, the only sanctuary we have is in Christ. It's in our spiritual position that we have in Christ. That's the only sanctuary we have. When you put on the armor of God, the first thing is you gird your loins with truth. Why is that so important? Because you're up against the father of lies. This is not a new thing. Eve was deceived, and she believed a lie. And she hadn't even yet sinned. So innocent, seemingly innocent people, can be, good people can be deceived. Uh, so that's how important it is. If I tempt you, you know it. If I accuse you, you know it. If I deceive you, you don't know it. If you knew it, you're not deceived anymore. That's why the first thing you do is you gird your loins with truth. That's why it's truth that sets us free. And uh, the breastplate of righteousness, that's not my righteousness, that's his. And uh, so I stand in his victory. My righteousness is like a dirty rag, so I need his righteousness. Uh, so it all comes back, essentially. The way, the way I explain it to even a Christian, when you become a Christian, you step through a door. You, you step literally out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. And head is Christ, and we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But when you step through that door, albeit narrow at first, it's like there's two-story buildings on each side, and pimps and prostitutes are poking their head out, and, you know, come in here, you want to do this, and you don't believe this, and God doesn't love you, and all that junk. There's three responses to that. One is to believe it. You just sit down. You made a decision, but you're defeated. You're just sitting here. You're going nowhere. You actually could get up and walk towards Christ, but you don't know that. The other guy, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. Fighting a good fight, right? Actually, he's losing it, letting the devil set the agenda. Put up the shield of faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Take every thought captive of the obedience of Christ and keep on walking. And what will happen is it will get broader and broader and broader and easier and easier and easier. <clears throat> That's a struggle we all go through. We all go through it. Uh, but not very well explained, unfortunately. See, you know, I've had a few show times, <laughs> but that's what it is. It's show time. And I said, <clears throat> God is much more honored if we do everything decently and in order. If we never lose control, you really are manifesting the love of God and in his presence. You're losing control. You're letting the enemy manifest. You're letting him control the agenda. And fear will probably be the likely response. Think about this. What is the number one mental health problem of the world? Anxiety disorders. What was the first emotion expressed by Adam after he sinned? I was afraid. What's the number one commandment in Scripture? 400 times. Fear not. It's a huge problem. Huge problem. And, uh, but what if you had a way to sit down, just work with a person, 
and help them get rid of their junk. And we're, we're trying to get rid of the garbage. I always tell people, I said, your life is like a house. I said, and you haven't taken the garbage out in six months. And the answer is, oh, man, I got, that's going to attract a lot of flies, so I've got to get rid of the flies. No, no, you've got to get rid of the garbage. What I'm really saying is repentance and faith in God has always been the answer and will continue to be the answer. And so that's what we help people do. And we sit down. God is a wonderful counselor. He shows them what the junk is, and we get rid of it. And they walk out. Satan has no right to be here. So it is quite, quite simple. In fact, some people say it works so well they didn't even know this is a demonic problem. I said, I don't care. Because the real issue to me is their own personal relationship with God. That's the issue. And there are things that have, that have made a barrier to my intimacy with God, such as bitterness and unwillingness to forgive and sexual sins and that kind of a nature. So we help them get rid of that junk. And when they're rid of it, they're connected to God. Piece of cake to tell Satan to take a hike.